Welcome to our Powers Within podcast. I'm your host, Jasmine, and my hope for this podcast is to inspire you to take your power back and realize that you are the healer that you've been looking for all along. We are all capable of healing in mind, in body, and in soul. And before we get started, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is actually sponsored by our guest today, Jeannie Colwyn. Jeannie's a stress and a mind-body coach based in LA, and if you aren't familiar with her, you can go back and give episode 95 a listen, Feeling Our Feelings with Jeannie. It was actually one of my favorite episodes because she leaves us with simple practical action steps that we can begin implementing in our life right away to make positive impact. Jeannie herself spent 16 years battling fibromyalgia, chronic pain, and a myriad of other chronic symptoms that left her physically and mentally exhausted. She healed herself completely and is now obsessed with getting her clients fast results through her one-on-one mind, body, and TMS coaching program. This three-month program gives clients the support, consistency, and accountability to decrease stress, release stuck negative emotions, and finally heal their chronic pain. The best part is that Jeannie offers a free 45-minute consult where together you will identify what's holding you back so that you can take your next steps for healing. Go to her website, JeannieColwin.com, J-E-A-N-N-I-E-K-U-L-W-I-N.com, and book your free call today. And with that said, today I invited Jeannie back because we had such a great conversation the first time around. I wanted to get a chance to chat with her again. And today we have this fun conversation where we are going to dive deeper into the world of emotions, focusing particularly around fear and how fear can be a guide for us. Um, Jeannie has such an uplifting energy about her, and I just had a lovely time getting to chat with her once again. So please do enjoy. All right, Jeannie, thanks so much for being here with me today for round two. And thanks for, yeah, just coming back to the podcast again. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be back and go deeper. Yeah, me too. Actually, I'm really excited about our topic. I know we've been kind of talking offline and we've been talking about uh, fear. And I know that when you first mentioned having a discussion around fear, I got really excited because (laughs) I think it's an important topic for us to address in a multitude of ways. So I would love to kind of just open the floor for you to share some thoughts around fear when it comes to the healing journey and why you think this is such an important topic yourself. Yeah, such a good topic. And I think because I am a mind-body coach and in the TMS community, we always talk about fear and you know, fear is fueling our symptoms. We want to bring safety. And so then We kind of, I think a lot of us, if we're on this journey, can understand that with our body and the symptoms and the pain, or if there's sensations, and really to change the relationship that we have with the sensations. But I think it can get a little goofy when we look at fear in other parts of our life. So that's what we want to dive into. And as a stress coach, I can see the fear and a lot of other emotions as messengers, it's information, it's wisdom. So yeah, there's a quote that my mentor uses, and he says that fear is a compass showing you where to go. Let's just take that in. I'm going to say it again because it's so good. Fear is a compass showing you where to go. And the first thing I think of when I think of this is my own personal journey as a teacher for my whole life, almost 19 years. I was terrified to leave my job. So there's so much fear. Uh, But there was fear and anxiety to stay as well. I mean, I was so just not in alignment, not knowing what I wanted, not grounded. I think a lot of us, if we've struggled with TMS or symptoms, it's really hard. And that's something I want to talk about today too, is how do you know what your intuition is saying? Because we don't want to hang out in our body. So afraid to leave my job, but afraid to stay. And yeah. So when we look at these emotions and fear too, we can really see that First of all, there's information, like we said, and messages. So for fear, I mean, we can start to have faith, start doing the inner work. Is there a next step or an action to take? Like, is there something that we need to prepare in order to move forward? So a lot of us, we can get kind of paralyzed in fear and then we can overthink. (laughs) This is a great question. How do you know if you're overthinking? Because you're not taking action. (laughs) And, you know, us coaches, it's all about the action. So it's a really juicy topic. And fear is one of the emotions. And 
yeah, that's just kind of how I want to start off with that so far. Okay. Yeah, I like that because something that just came up for me as I was listening to you with that introduction um, into fear is I instantly started noticing, okay, fear can be a really powerful guide, right? Like you learn, hey, um, if you get this like intuitive hit and you just know you're not like, don't turn left right now, you know, and you don't mm-hmm. turn left and there was a reason for it. You, you've heard of like the idea of emotional addictions, right? Not not conscious emotional addictions, but how we can essentially be in a sense addicted to certain emotions where they become a prominent theme mm-hmm. or center in our life. Mm-hmm. So I wonder as we're as you're breaking all of this down, if we could also address do we how do we discern when fear is actually there to be a guide and actually help to steer us into a, a direction that's more aligned to our truth versus somebody who might just have developed over time an extreme amount of fear around, you know, let's say almost everything because mm-hmm. they've just become almost um, at a subconscious level a emotionally addicted to fear. Yeah, no, this is a great question. There's definitely several parts to this. So first thing that I like to share with clients is that, yes, we have fear. That's a lot of times our ego, right? So that fear that and our ego, it's overthinking. We're in our head. It could be the body too that's dysregulated. So it's hard to tap into our intuition. And I always say the intuition is in the body, right? Have you heard of a gut? I have a gut feeling, or a gut knowing. So that's the body. (laughs) It's in the gut, right? Tony Robbins, he always says, like, if you're in your head, you're dead. So I think the first part of this might be to really emphasize. And I know, again, we said, for us, if we're struggling with symptoms, mind, body, chronic pain, chronic everything, it's really not safe. A lot of us don't feel safe in our body. But that is the healing journey of starting to come back and ground. So grounding into the body, allowing ourselves certain amount of time per week or per day to have the stillness. And that stillness is where you're going to find the answers. And it might not come in that meditation, in that breath work, in that whatever it is, yoga flow or practice, right? But that constant grounding and coming back. So that's a little bit of the first part of allowing in our life. And Nicole Sachs, I mean, she says so many things are trauma responses. So feeling guilty and not taking time for ourselves, right? Or people pleasing or perfectionism. There's so many reasons why we don't take time for ourselves. So feeling shame to put ourselves first or feeling shame to take time for ourselves to meet our own needs. That could be something that needs to heal. Again, kind of coming from a trauma response. So I would say that is one part of the answer. Another thing that came up when we're talking about fear versus intuition is our values. So I'll use my example of being a teacher. It wasn't aligned with my values, what I wanted anymore. And our values change as we grow, maybe uh, in years of age, and also just as we do this thing called life and personal growth. So and maybe our, our family change, right? Like maybe we're a mom or a dad now and before we weren't or We valued our education and now we're really valuing free time. So I think that could be really helpful is what are our values of a relationship? Maybe it's time to make a change or leave or start one. For me, it was a job, but there's so many, there's so much benefit again. And we stay busy, right? Like a lot of times this, these emotions can overtake us and then we don't really dive in to do this deep work. So I think sometimes too, I think of the pain can be a big distraction. Have you ever thought about how the pain or chronic pain takes us away from this deep work or making big changes in our life? I know it came up for me when I was trying to transition. It's like, I don't have time to think about my passions and values. I'm in fight or flight right now. So it can be protective. Right. Right. It it can take us away until we make a choice to do the work and then it actually can bring us into. Exactly. So we can look at what is the pain, like what's the purpose of the pain? And I know it can sound cliche and there is no purpose and I'm not one of these, oh, your pain is a gift, right? I mean, later, if you're able to see that and the grace, that might be helpful for you. But yeah, when we're in it, when we're struggling on a day-to-day basis, right? But we can see what are we avoiding, right? Like are these emotions, what's the message? So when we talked about like the word that came up for me when you were talking about these emotions is we can get, we can indulge in these emotions, right? I mean, sometimes with depression, I remember I said this on your last podcast when I was here, sometimes with depression, we're actually not feeling sad. We're just numb. We're actually not feeling emotions. So that would be something 
the first piece of this with our emotions is identify it. What are we feeling? Put a name to it, right? And we don't have to say, I'm sad if you are feeling sadness. It's, oh, there's sadness. So identify it and get curious. Oh, huh. I'm noticing that or it's, I'm feeling that in my body. So if you're ready to appreciate it or just at least acknowledge it, that would be great. But what I always tell clients and what I've done the work on is actually feeling these sensations. So there's an emotional, sorry, there's a physical component in the body for our emotions. So this is something I had no idea about. A lot of people that work with me, it's unfamiliar because like I said, I didn't feel my emotions. They came out sideways because I had TMS and chronic pain. So really getting curious of, okay, yep, that's an emotion. That's sadness. Where is it? And just like hunger, we get sensations in the body indicating that we want to eat. And yeah, you think it, right? I'm hungry, I want to eat. But you actually, if you tune in, can feel maybe the rumbling in your stomach, the little pulsating or the tingling to notify you. It's information. There's the message that it's time to eat. So we can start with that. Or if someone has felt butterflies when they're nervous, these are sensations in the body. So feeling, I know we touched on it a little bit the first time I was here, is staying curious trying to not go back into the head, into the story. And we said together, this is easier said than done, but this is part of it. So that's like the first part of emotions too, because if you don't feel it, like you said, they're just, they compound over time. So we think that if we avoid it or we numb it or we buffer it, we just don't have to feel it. And that's a myth that we're debunking feelings, emotions, they stay in the body. They don't like the trauma, the stress, these things too, they don't just go away because years have gone by or you're distracting. So they're there, again, as information. And what I like to say is ultimately it's for us to take action or take your next step. The information, the message, always for you to take a step or a shift, maybe not like actual action, but maybe the action is to change your belief or change your story. Yeah. So this is kind of on a side a side note, and it might, maybe you'll talk you'll get to this in a little bit um, as it as this conversation progresses around fear. Mm-hmm. But I, I just wanted to say it right now while I was thinking about it. It may something you said um, triggered a thought. Sometimes I've I don't know if you've personally experienced this. I know I have, but I've also talked to people and witnessed people having this experience. For example, there's a program that really helps people to. Um, find their true values. And I literally had somebody say, I think that deep down, I'm afraid to take that program because I'm afraid to actually know what my real values Mm -hmm. are because I'm afraid Mm -hmm. that it might mean that I need to make a big change in my life. And that change might be really hard. Absolutely. (laughs) How do you, yeah. So I would love to hear you at some point speak to that and how you would coach or help or support somebody through that. Because especially a lot of people, um, If we are, let's say, really focusing on the chronic uh, pain or illness community, Mm -hmm. we're already dealing with the fact that we've probably already experienced so much fear around our symptoms. We've probably already felt so unsafe in our bodies for so long, and maybe we're finally starting to come back into safety and learn how to not be afraid. But then when we're in, uh, like, confronted with, um, some kind of deeper truth that says, hey, this isn't, this job's not good for you, or this relationship that you've been in for 20 years isn't healthy for you, or you need to move because where you live is not, you know, making, helping you feel well. Like these can be really big and scary and seem like a lot of daunting steps. And if this person's already dealt with so much fear or lack of safety in their life and they're finally coming back into that, how do they take these giant steps to stay? true to themselves and honor that guidance that is showing up without going back into overwhelm or, you know, um, creating that lack of safety uh, deeply in the body again. Does that make sense? Oh my goodness. Such a great, great, great question. And so at first thing is just to have compassion, right? I'm putting my hands on my heart of, yes, I think we all have done this in some way, or I would think maybe a lot of us who are in this space. So I would say, First of all, it's great to get support because it is a big decision or action. So if it's coaching or a therapist or a mentor, I mean, that could be something that is really needed to make a big change. I mean, I worked with coaches and did a lot of inner work. So we're not saying that the first time 
you get the download, maybe you change unless you're very someone who likes to take action. And there's there are different philosophies with coaching. Tony Robbins is like, burn the boats, right? And and take your big, huge, scary leap and do that thing. But the way I approach it, especially because of nervous system regu- dysregulation, is just taking your next little baby step. So also having a practice that you can come to, and it can be different practices that brings you back into alignment and that gut knowing desire. I mean, some of our desires, we pretend we don't want them. Oh, I don't really want to be rich. (laughs) I don't really want to have a big house because maybe we judge it. Oh, it's bad for me to have money or that's selfish to have a big house. And so when we can actually get true to ourselves, like, hey, this is actually what I want and maybe from our family or our friends, there's some judgment. So again, we cannot emphasize enough how much, how important it really is to have that stillness. Maybe it's a journaling practice. Maybe it's body-based, like the things that I love to do so that you can come back. And so breath work supported me personally with me like, oh, I don't really want to leave teaching and oh, it's fine. And (laughs) will I have the summers off, right? My ego and the fears trying to justify me staying safe. But when you have a practice that's body-based, you get out of the head, out of the ego. I kept coming back after the breathwork class when I was really out of the fear and out of the ego that, no, that's fear. I get that. It's trying to keep me safe. But this desire has been in me for years, right? It doesn't go away. And so I think that really is one piece of this is having a practice, having that stillness of really knowing what you want. Because we can't push that stuff down. And if you're into manifesting or law of attraction, right, what you focus on is the belief. We want to focus on what we want, not what we don't want. So I know we can get kind of stuck in this chronic pain journey of like focusing on the pain and focusing on what we don't want. And for this big life that you and I mentioned on the last episode, it is taking some of these inspired action steps. So how do you know what your next inspired action step in my In my world, we got to have some stillness or definitely getting some support also to kind of pull away what these limiting beliefs are. I mean, I had all the limiting beliefs about I couldn't do this because, and I had all the reasons and some are true and some aren't. And it's really great to have someone point out this belief is keeping you stuck. So that would kind of be just like the first part of it before I go into the other parts. Is that helpful so far? It is. Yeah. And then I'm going to have you keep going and I'm kind of just keeping in my mind um, follow-up questions. <laughs> yeah. And then of course, like what are, like I said, we talk about what our values are and kind of, again, we can get stuck in what our family's values are. I was a teacher, right? Teachers have a different mindset with money and entrepreneurs have a different mindset with money. And it was like, oh crap, I have to work on my money mindset. (laughs) And it's not overnight. And that's why we want to bring so much compassion. And it seems really easy to beat myself up. Like, I don't know how to do all the tech stuff and I don't know how to do sales and marketing. And then I would, again, justify why I had to stay in something that wasn't fulfilling. So even though that was true, I didn't know sales. I didn't know how to do marketing. I wasn't on social media. They're true, and we can get stuck in those beliefs. So really having someone to point those out, showing you that they're skills, that you can work through it. Same thing with relationships, right? I think sometimes with this positive thinking mentality. Now they call it toxic positivity, which I love that there's a name for it. We can settle in our life. I mean, if it's a good relationship and no relationship is perfect, but if you're out of alignment, it's not healthy. This could be a work relationship as well, a business relationship. And yeah, it's hard to take the next step or make a change, but we really have to do this deeper work. So that is why I say that We can get stuck, and like you said, in the emotions and the overwhelm. We know we're overthinking if we don't take action. So when we are in overwhelm, and I have clients they're not sure of their next step. It's like their next step. Let's just take one small step, and you're going to get clarity. And I know for me personally, I'm such I'm this recovering perfectionist. I call it, and I was so afraid to make mistakes. And learning that this is going to give me clarity. As I take action, I'm going to get clarity maybe on what I don't want. It's not going to be this smooth sailing of, oh, everything just goes perfectly, right? I've learned which part of coaching like lights me up the most and which type of clients and how my business should be run by making mistakes. And that's something that 
a lot of people in this community might, might, how do I say this nicely, might resonate with because this goodism, this perfectionism, this people pleasing is, is part of our traits for some of us. So again, working through that mindset of having to do all or nothing, having to do it perfectly, right? So it's like how you said to your point, well, I don't want to do this next thing or make a change because in my mind, maybe subconsciously it has to be perfect, right? And I can't mess up. Jasmine, does that sound familiar? It does for me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can get stuck in the, well, what if, you know, you do, I, I mean, I've personally done this in relationships and other things and jobs or anything. You can get stuck in, oh, but what if I'm walking away from something that's actually really good? And Mm -hmm. what if this other thing isn't actually better? Or what if, you know, or I mean, it can be a million and and one different excuses. A lot of us can just get stuck on not knowing how it's possible. Um, Something that really supported me, because you said getting support, support can seriously come in the form of a friendship sometimes, Mm -hmm. just somebody who knows the right thing to say. A dear friend of mine, when I wanted to travel, I was like stuck in this mindset of all the ways it would never be able to work. I couldn't see past all the, all the hurdles. And she literally stopped me one day and said, well, let's stop focusing on why it won't work. And let's just start exploring the ways it can work. Law of attraction. I love it. (laughs) And, 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 and it was amazing because it was that that simple shift. And suddenly I started just brainstorming and taking notes like, okay, well, maybe I could get a sublease or maybe I could do this. And then what if I do this like that? And all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, this is possible. I can Mm -hmm. do this. Yeah, it's really exciting. And just piggybacking on this too, right? This can, now we're going into deeper layers, right? So it's always something that could be super, I don't want to say superficial, but it might seem easy or not that profound. And then as we go deeper, right, and I know you and I spoke about that uncertainty of taking a risk and not having control. So when we do something big, or we take a risk, we try something that we don't know that we're good at or traveling when there's not certainty in every angle, it's scary, right? So really realizing that control is an illusion. And yeah, having support in a friendship or family member, that's awesome. We want people to support you and our dreams. And And that is something that we all have to decide for us what is settling in our life. We talked about last time, a big life. And if you want a big life, you are going to have this wide range of emotions. I have clients who are nurses and in the medical field, we talk about the flat line, right? If you are just no emotions and nothing's happening, right? It's like you're dead. They show like there's nothing happening. And so our emotions are supposed to be big, feeling them the joy, the happiness, feeling the sadness, these so-called negative, even though they're not negative, but feeling that wide range of emotions. And that looks different for everyone, right? And not settling. We take this toxic positive, oh, I should be happy. I should write this amount of money or this relationship, like you said, this, this where I am in my life. And so we're here to kind of wake you up and let you know that you don't have to settle. Yeah, you can do something that's maybe unfamiliar, that's new and taking a risk. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. At what point in your journey, uh, your healing journey, because you were sick for a very long time and trying to figure out um, how to be well, at what point in your journey did you end up um, having the confidence to finally step away from teaching? And how much of a role did that play in your healing? That's a good question. It kind of all came together for me in this beautiful synchronicity. Breathwork came into my life. It was probably my last year of teaching. And it's interesting because for me as a teacher, people might not realize this, but I guess you could quit any time as a teacher, but really to be in integrity with your school and your school district, you're going to want to quit in the summer or maybe the winter break or something. Like It's not like, oh, I can quit any time. So I kind of felt this pressure of I either do it now (laughs) this summer or I got to wait a year because you're leaving the the classroom without anyone else. Um, So yeah, it was probably like my last year of teaching where I started really doing this deep inner work of learning about coaching and doing my training for that. And I started as a health and wellness coach, really working on that side before I shifted into mind, body, and stress. So that last year of really this deep dive into 
my coaching and my spiritual practice and my mental health and all these things. And then wouldn't you know, breath work comes into my life around this time. I ended a relationship that was no longer serving me and TMS came in my life and all together, boom, right? So it was really that last year. I mean, I was on a very long healing journey. I didn't learn about TMS until the very end. And uh, yeah, I wish I had heard about it sooner. I wish I'd learned about it sooner, which is why partly why I'm just so passionate about this and want so many people to hear of it and know about it and share it because it's life changing. So yeah, it probably took me again, if I could quit, maybe if I had a more normal corporate job where I could quit at any time, I would have been able to quit sooner. But it took me like a year of like this really intense, but I had been doing a lot of coaching and like working on myself and changing my relationship with my body with the pain. It's just I wasn't doing it as I look at it now, kind of the way I would suggest, right? I was more in the medical, traditional Western world of when I got the diagnosis with fibromyalgia, right? Doing what that community would say is helpful, like taking the, you know, like the medicine or the, the prescriptions or seeing the chiropractors and the physical therapist. So I was still in that route until yeah, really once I found out about TMS, it's like, oh, I don't need to be going to see as many doctors and laying off all the treatments. And then guess what? I had all this time to dive into the things that really lit me up. So yeah, I was so busy with taking care of myself with, like I said, the appointments, the treatments, the doctors that I couldn't really imagine. Like you can't even imagine when you're in fight or flight and so dysregulated about all this amazingness that could happen in your life. So yeah, that's kind of the breakdown of it happened for me. Okay. So then you were kind of on the cusp where you were feeling better and better, and then you quit your job at that point. Yeah. Actually, when I left, I was still having symptoms. I was still having like sinus infection. I had a horrible sinus infection that summer, which can be TMS. It could be like emotions kind of coming to the surface. I was in my intensive yoga training. So it was interesting. I left kind of in fear too, right? Because I actually wasn't feeling really well, but I was confident that I was on the right path with TMS. Absolutely. So I had the confidence and I knew this is just another symptom and we're going to clear this up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like making that choice to like st stand in your truth and leave something that wasn't serving you any longer, even though it was scary? Do you feel like it actually was a part of your healing? Do you feel like it supported you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Abs I feel, I always say it's like the best decision I ever made one of the best decisions by far and I had so much fear and it was so interesting because so much fear right like in my intuition I knew I'd never be going back but I had so much stuff like uh, if you're a teacher listening to this or know a teacher you have pens and you have like all the materials and you have I had kids um projects and like things that I could use for demonstrations and modeling right so I had all this stuff and so obviously like a lot of the stuff belongs to like the school but like kids work and examples and the files. And this was before I started teaching before everything was on the computer. So I had like documents and I had so I had a whole filing cabinet of lesson plans and papers. And I kept a lot Jasmine because I was just so afraid to like let it go. And I realized that stuff to me was safety, right? So it was really scary. And again, it was my intuition saying that I could do it. I really knew I wouldn't be coming back, but I don't know. I had to hold on to some pens. <laughs> I had to hold on to some files temporarily. And now I can kind of laugh. And I, I mean, I used to have lesson books from every single year and letting those go. Wow. It's a lot. So yeah, I mean, again, that fear is a compass showing you where to go because I had so much fear. <laughs> it really indicated to me that this was my next step. And I had been preparing for it mentally. And of course, when you do it, it's a big change and a big shift. But yeah, I mean, I definitely, for me, it was time. And I mean, I wish, again, I could have done it sooner. I wish I had done it earlier. So that's why this is like a wake, this could be a wake up call to certain people of like how much longer, right? We have the new year, 2023. And this is the time to take stock of what's working in our life. Are we happy? Are we settling? And this big life theme of really, taking your next step and making it imperfect, making mistakes. I'm here for it. What would you say though, for somebody who, like I was saying earlier, that just might be so afraid of so many things who they're like, it doesn't necessarily feel like the fear is a guide guiding mm -hmm. them or a compass guiding mm -hmm. them out of something unhealthy or into something that's more aligned because they're kind of just afraid of all of the above. 
you know? Yeah. So I think like how I usually always work with people is definitely the safety of the fear in terms of symptoms. So I think definitely when I work with a client, we focus on the symptoms and the fear and the body and the grounding and all that. And then what sorts starts to happen, maybe second month, <laughs> I have my clients fill out a form. What do they want to work on? There's less and less talk about the body and the pain because symptoms are starting to come down and quiet, right? So then we get into other work like money or uh, career or health, um, you know, other areas in their life that they want to focus on. So yeah, definitely. If the nervous system is, I mean, I was so dysregulated. I had so much anxiety that, yeah, I couldn't be making my next step at that time. So I think focusing on what it is. So that's where we can take time on a daily basis and check in and also check in with these emotions. And I just kind of want to piggyback to what I think could be helpful is like bringing down the fear and the nervous system the dysregulation, let's regulate that. And let's also look at our emotions because what happens is how we talked about the emotions just don't go away, right? So oh, there's anger, there's frustration, there's overwhelm. I'm just going to push that shit down because <laughs> I don't want to deal with that. So actually moving through the emotions can also be helpful. So I can give you a couple uh, tips on terms of what the emotions might be communicating and this could be helpful too. Okay, I want to go into that, but I'm going to stick with fear for just a few more minutes. Oh, sure. Okay. And then we're going to go back to that. So follow-up question is how do – okay, so let's say there's somebody listening – and they're they're like, okay, I'm clear. Yeah, I I'm I've been married for you know 30 years. I'm I'm I know I'm miserable. I know this isn't the life I'm supposed to be living. And and they're like, but I just they can't see the way out, right? They can't see how they can do it on their own. Say they've never worked, they don't have money, they don't have a way to mm-hmm. support themselves. Like so all these factors, right? Like we already said, hey, my mentor said, hey, stop focusing on why it won't work and start exploring the ways it can. So Let's say that somebody's willing to do that, but it might be, you know, it's not always just as easy for one person to the next or one situation to the next. Like in some situations, it might be as easy as, okay, I can just take the action and be done. But in another situation, it might be like, okay, I'm going to start taking small steps and I'm going to move in that direction, but it could be a while. It might might Mm -hmm. be like a one to two year plan, you know? How do we create a sense of not just safety, but let's just say like we're making a choice to stay right now in something, even though it's not aligned, but we can convey this trust, this internal trust and comfort knowing that like, hey, I'm like my true self right now knows that this ultimately is not ideal long term, but right now I'm choosing it until I can create a better scenario. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. I've actually worked with a woman and who was wanting to get a divorce, but we didn't start there. So that's a great question. So of course, every relationship is different, but in terms of like a relationship, right? So, and again, my journey, it did take a long time because I struggled with the health for a long time and I did do a lot of inner work and um, you know, different courses and trainings and stuff. So we really want to bring compassion with this is not just like, oh, just take action and do it, right? Like Chasma said, like, yes, definitely. So in terms of a marriage or wanting to leave and you've been married for 30 years, what your next step might be just to go inward and work on your worthiness of it or the self-esteem or the confidence because, yeah, if you haven't worked, let's say, okay, so maybe the next step is just to make a list of things that you like. Or the next step is just what class can I take? Or what do I, let me uh, think about jobs that I like or talk to my friends or talk about different ways to earn money. And if that's too scary, then maybe really, again, working on processing and feeling some of these emotions on, yeah, just so many, I think like the inner work, right? Like this is where the growth comes from. What's the self-esteem we can work on? You know, women, sometimes we do kind of struggle for our worthiness sometimes. And some women, we think that we're worthy if we achieve certain things or we hustle. And this inner work can just be oh, worthy just because I'm me <laughs> and not feeling unworthy to leave. Or, you know, there could be feelings of sadness of leaving and there could be limiting beliefs right that we need to work through so sometimes it's like doing this inner work and there isn't the action of actually leaving but yeah there's a limiting belief that I can't get a job because I haven't worked in 30 years there's a belief that 
uh, I'll never find another partner again. So this is some of the inner work that can happen to bring down the fear without having to, yeah, make the decision of right now I'm leaving. But there could be little micro decisions that make sense for like what the next step could be. The next step could be, I don't even know, like I've worked with people like, I don't even know what I like, Jeannie. I don't even know what my hobbies are. And me too, I struggle, especially in the pandemic. It's like, you can't do anything in like groups. It's like, what do I like? What do I like to do? What are my hobbies? And so that could be your next step. Like what lights you up? What do you love to do or learn about? What if nothing does? Because sometimes people who are so chronically ill or or in pain, like even as they come out of the pain and they're healing, mm -hmm. their world got so small that it's like, oh, I don't know. Nothing lights me up. You know, what do you suggest for that? Right. So I'm here to challenge people on that because I've had people say to me, I have no idea what I want to do. I want to change. I want to make it, and they always do, which is interesting. Or everyone, I'm not going to say everyone in the world. I'm going to say the people I've worked with. So maybe they're reaching out to me. But there's like maybe something that we're afraid to say, right? Or we're embarrassed or we're like, I, don't, I could never achieve it. But even like a field of something, right? Like I'm really into sustainability, for example, or photography. Like I have no idea how to make money on that or what that looks like. But, and I say too, a good starting point, if you're really like, nothing lights me up, we, this is a great tip is to think about what you used to do as a little kid, like a little girl or a little boy. Like I used to love to read and now all I read are kind of business books or marketing, right? And like coaching these things that help me in my business. And so this was a great question. I used to, I would go to the library and pull out as many books as like the limit, right? Like you can do. And what else did you love to do? Maybe as you were a kid, you loved to bake with your mom or you love gymnastics. And so maybe gymnastics as a 50 year old woman, woman isn't a possibility, but like, oh, I love gymnastics and maybe there's some stretching I can do or like really being embodied or doing something in my body. So that could be a really great tip of what did you used to love to do? And if it's not possible to do now, like how can you change it or tweak it a little bit so that it's something like relative, right? Like I'm not gonna be reading books like I did the same topics, right? But like, oh, I just liked reading books for pleasure. And I loved swimming, going in the swimming pool and just jumping around and having fun, like some of these activities. So that could be your very next step. So someone comes to me and they want to leave their partner. And then their next step is like, oh, Jeannie's telling me to have fun. Like this is actually challenging. I don't know how it relates to this end goal, but do you see how it could just be a starting point? Mm -hmm, absolutely. It's like a starting point. Like, what do you love? Like what lights you up? Like what brings you joy? And then as we start to like, yeah, the breadcrumbs of like, oh, this bring, maybe I could do this for work, or maybe this is like, a, I don't need to work. It's like, we don't, I don't know, like someone can volunteer and have a purpose driven life volunteering, depending on their financial situation. So yeah. And again, we do tend to, I did it. I spent all my time focusing on what I didn't want. And if you're open to the law of attraction, this can help you even further and we know that law of attraction, even though like the TMS community doesn't like talk about it so much, this is one of the principles of TMS healing, right? Like we never say, think about your symptoms and stay at home all day and just wallow in it. We do say, right, bring safety, try to have some joy, even if you're in pain. There are some maybe a little bit of extra, you know, depending on what it is that's going on. But I know for me, I had chronic fatigue. And so all the doctors are like, rest, don't do anything. And then learning about this approach, mind, body, oh, go for a walk. Oh, try and do something. So again, I'm focusing on what I can do, even if it was two minutes. I mean, I went on very short walks. That's all I could do. But mm -hmm. just that mindset of like, oh, wow, I did five minutes. That's more than I did yesterday. And yeah, and then being present and mindful See if we can stop some of the, not, I don't want to say stop, but notice these thoughts that aren't serving us of, I can't, I mean, I had this all or nothing. I can't have fun. I'm in pain. I said that all the time, all the time. I can't have fun. I can't be happy. So then we can look at like, oh, I can't, I don't know, have a relationship and be sick or, or enjoy. Or I had a client who was on disability. So he felt guilty. It makes sense. And I was on disability too. I can't have fun and laugh got with my friends, I'm on disability. Like what will people think or what would people say? So it can really stop us a lot from living a big life. And it's almost giving ourselves and my clients like permission, like you can have fun. Like it's, it's quite profound, right? It's, it's, it's interesting how it affects us so much. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And it all, everything you were just saying, it made me think too, how, how sometimes maybe we are, a f- when, when we're talking about like not knowing what we want, you know, or what makes us happy or what brings us joy or lights us up or not being clear about our values, we can almost be afraid to go inward and explore this out of a fear that we might, you know, like I was saying much earlier that we might discover something that would be really hard. But to just also remember that just because we discover that something isn't working for us doesn't mean we have to take all that action right away when we can actually Mm -hmm. remind ourselves like, okay, I might discover this job's not aligned to my highest values, but that doesn't mean I have to be afraid to discover that because it doesn't mean I have to like go quit my job right away and, and end up in a ditch, you know, it's just bringing that awareness. And it's the all or nothing thinking that I have, have had, I'll say have had, sometimes have still, right? And so how you do one thing is how you do everything. So even going, this is so interesting, but going for a five minute walk actually is really powerful because it stops that all or nothing thinking. When I read a book, it's like, well, I can only read Chasmith if I have this beautiful, I don't know, vision of me on the couch with the throw pillows and I have all this time and Now I encourage people, go read a book, go read two pages, go read. I had a client read two paragraphs a day because she just, the time element, right? So yes, breaking that all or nothing thinking. And let's say for the example, the photography is something, yeah, you don't have to quit your job and become a photographer. You could just take a class. You can just start shooting on your own. You could look into different options. I agree with you. It's like sometimes we don't want that clarity because oh no, no, there's something I've got to do. But if you just look at it again as wisdom, as information, also getting clear on what you don't want. So you're like, I don't know what I like. Okay, well, what you don't, what do you not like? Do you like being in an office all day? Is that what you love? Some people do. They love to be with other people. Some people want the freedom. So we can get a lot of clarity with things that we don't want and reverse engineer so we can focus on what we do want. So I really want to encourage people that there's so much information from what you don't want Mm -hmm. and not to discount that. Yeah. I spent the first 42 years of my life learning in relationships what I don't want. (laughs) Yeah. And then you can get so clear on what you do want. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, relationships is a big one, definitely. But there can be a lot of fear with it. I think it's a really juicy topic. Um, And again, if you're in this DMS community, like the people pleasing, confrontation, you know, some of these things are scary. And so when we use fear as kind of a compass, I know I want to shut down sometimes when things are uncomfortable. It's like, ooh, I'm growing by talking about this thing. Oh, this is uncomfortable. I can feel that in my body. I'd rather not talk about this or avoid it. And my body's telling me this probably is important to me or my values or something could be addressed. So yeah, we can practice if we're thinking about relationships, we can practice it in all relationships. So not only in romantic is where all the work is done, we practice with our neighbors or our friends, right? Because how you do one thing, how you do everything. So that's the good news. It doesn't have to be like, okay, Chasmith, like let's throw ourselves into the scary, hairy uh If it's a romantic relationship that's scary for us, we can practice in all our relationships, speaking up for ourselves and communicating, being vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Okay, so let's, I didn't, I don't want to forget that I wanted you to go back to um, the other emotions as well from, um, because you said, you know, fear can be a compass, but we talked about how all emotions, even the ones that we've um, learned to judge as quote unquote bad, which are not bad, they're just information, and they can serve as a guide. Do you want to give some examples of some of these other ones? Yeah, I think this is kind of interesting. And we'll just do a few so that we're not giving too much. But yeah, really starting to shift what we think. I mean, I just thought it was a really bad nuisance, right? And I would just, and a lot of us is like, how do we manage our emotions? And I always cringe with hearing that. So, I mean, we'll do anything to avoid an emotion and we can go walk on the moon. We've sent people to the moon. We can walk on that. But like this thing in our body, these vibrations, these sensations, (laughs) these chemicals, like it's very foreign to us. We really don't know what's going on. So for example, frustration If you look at it as a guide, if you look at it as wisdom, it could be actually kind of exciting. It could be a positive sign that you're close to the breakthrough or that 
you're going to find the answer or the right approach. So it could be guidance to change, right? So if you were, I'll just use for me, I had so many tech frustrations when I first started and that frustration kind of guided me to do something differently, ask for help, right? If I had no feedback and my brain was like, it's fine, whatever, you don't need it, I would just stop maybe and, okay, this isn't for me. But actually that frustration, we can look at it, is it exciting, right? Because the brain believes like, oh, you can actually figure this out or there's a better approach or maybe I can't figure it out on my own, but there is a better way. So the message is really to change our approach, our strategy, how we're doing things. And if you look at it as it could be positive, that could be helpful. Mm -hmm. That's one. And then the other thing that I think is helpful for our community is anger, right? And so you and I spoke about, I mean, there's a lot here, but just as a brief description, the message, what we're communicating is that a rule or standard might have been violated, right? Or like a boundary. And maybe we even did it to ourselves. Like maybe we violated our own boundary and it could be, ourselves, a person we know, maybe it could be, um, you know, a situation or like COVID, right? It's not like a person, but we're mad at the situation. So we might have misinterpreted it. There might be room for me to grow. Like I need to like be less rigid. I need to be more flexible. I need to change my approach. There's a communication that needs to happen. If there's anger, let's say in a relationship, or like the behavior needs to change because I've never communicated my boundary or never shared that this upsets me. So there's healing in this. And I say too a lot that our triggers are our teachers. So when we're triggered and maybe we get frustrated or we get angry, that's a juicy one. So if your triggers are your teachers, that can really be helpful. So paying attention to what's coming up in your body and knowing that the emotions are here like we said, they can have messages. And of course, there's so many examples of different types of anger and frustration, but this is kind of a, a broad overview that it's to, yeah, give you these messages and we can choose, right, how to pay attention. And like I said, it's identifying it, acknowledging it, getting curious and really feeling it through the body. And it really does correlate to the first theme that we talked about with fear, because when the nervous system is dysregulated and there's like fear and anxiety, I always say that the anxiety really many oftentimes is on top of the emotions. So it's like the anxiety is like the top layer. So we're kind of holding down these underneath. Maybe there's anger, frustration, sadness, grief. So that fear, healing that, paying attention to that, learning what that is and that anxiety, once we can do that, that sometimes is why it's there in the first place, right? To like shut down all the emotions down there. So it is a big awareness. It's a shift. It's feeling safety, right? Just like we want to feel safe with our sensations or if there's pain in the body, we also want to bring safety to all our emotions and know that it's healthy to feel it. And the more we do this, the more wisdom and the more you're going to be able to access your intuition, which is going back to where we started with the, the podcast too, right? Of how do I, I don't know, Jeannie, like I'm confused. I don't know what I like. I don't know anything. I bet if we do a little bit of this inner work, get into our body, start feeling what's on top, we're going to tap into our deep, deep intuition and wisdom because we have it. It's just a practice. Maybe we're out of practice lately. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder how to discern the difference between, um, I'll give two examples. Let's say, and I talked about this earlier, like when emotions become almost like subconscious addictions, you know, they're, they're a pattern in your life. Mm -hmm. I wonder how to discern when something is cause for legitimate anger, you know, because you realize that uh, you allowed um, one of your boundaries to be crossed either from somebody else or yourself versus somebody who just gets so easily angered all the time and... Mm -hmm maybe it's kind of that state where they do feel safe, you know, because a lot of people can feel um, safety in a, in a dysregulated state, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, they feel safe in the chaos, safe in the anger, safe in the, in, in certain emotions. So how do we discern when it is actually an emotion that is there to be a guide versus an emotion that is I guess in a sense, I could see how they could all be guides, but truly when it's like more of like a habit, do you know what I'm saying? Like where it's become more of a habit. Yes. <laughs> there you go. 
Yeah, well, I would say, yeah, I agree with you. They're all a guide. They're all information. It could just be information of, wow, I need to work on what I believe or I'm unflexible or things like that. So that's what I would say. So I, I always encourage people to feel all our emotions and not judge them. So I was really good at judging. I shouldn't be mad. I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't be sad. So that's a sneaky way to stay in the ego and stay in the head. So literally, once we realize that we are in this state, identify it, you can acknowledge it and really start to feel it. And as you feel it, right, staying present, grounded, noticing where if it's in the chest, in the belly, actually feeling it, then you can do the work. So I like to encourage people that feelings are for feeling. So before we do this deep work of what's the message and all that, that's fine. But in my book, let's start to feel it first and kind of take the charge down and then we can do the work. So that would be my, right? All our feelings are valid. Our, all of our feelings are to be felt. If we don't feel it, then that can be unhealthy in the, in the body. And then, yeah, then we can start to process. Is this a story Right? Am I in victim? Like, oh, oh, let's say someone crossed a boundary. Oh, poor me. And this always happens to me. But if you actually look at it after you kind of discharge that anger, and there's ways to discharge. Like, I use breath work when I'm angry and I can feel it in the body. Like, I need to breathe that out. Or someone might go for a walk. Or I, you know, moving somatically the the anger that charge from the body. So first, I would recommend that. And if there's a practice that you like. I mean, people can do tapping. There's lots of ways to kind of move and feel the emotion. And then you can do the work of, okay, what's the message? And like you said, yeah, it could just be awareness that, hey, I'm not taking good care of myself or I'm not spending enough time. I'm just not doing any self-care. So I'm just stressed out. And so everything is, you know, making me upset or it's, there's a lot. I mean, I guess we'd have to look at the individual information, but even like, let's say you're in the car and you get really upset someone cuts you off. I mean, even that's wisdom of like, huh, maybe I am not giving myself enough time and I'm doing too much. And I'm right. Like, even if we do realize it's our fault, so to speak, is that kind of answering your question of this could be, yeah, like it's not necessary to react and be aggressive, right. With our anger, but actually feeling the anger could be a clue that there needs to be some more space in your life. There needs to be more calmness, stillness, Maybe you're not processing and feeling your other emotions, and so everything's getting compounded. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. It does. If you look at, yeah, your emotions and your triggers are teachers, then that's the guide of, huh, right? Like, even if you're on social media, let's just say you're on social media and no one does anything to you, and you see someone and they trigger you. (laughs) I am so mad that this, I don't know, person has blonde hair and beautiful skin and big blue eyes and right? Like, okay, well, she didn't do anything. There's no conversation to be had with her. But why is that triggering me? Oh, because I'm not, I don't know, taking care of my skin, or I'm not, I don't know, maybe you see her like living a life that you want. That's information. Oh, you know what? I actually want to travel. I want to be doing some of these things. So yeah, it really is an opportunity if you're open to it to do some of this. And then we get more information and then that can guide us. Mm -hmm. I see that. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, just to clarify too, like I really think it's important to know that even anger, it's healthy to feel and there's healthy ways to feel it and process it. Yes, what we are kind of the stereotypical reaction from anger and the aggression and that volatility, yeah, isn't so safe and I'm not advocating that at all. But actually feeling like the anger in the body and knowing that that's healthy will be a way to move it. Yeah, and then you can get more clarity. Mm -hmm. So we see like on TV, like people get angry and throw things and are violent. No, no, we're not saying that. We're saying, yeah, move it and process it in a healthy way. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Like if you're having an argument with your significant other, rather than screaming at them, you could just say that you need, that you're feeling a lot of emotion and you need to take space and you can go in your room, Mm -hmm. shut the door and scream in a pillow. (laughs) Yeah, I do. I, after I do breath work, I tell people scream in a pillow and they can hit the pillow And yeah, sometimes you just need to go for a walk and taking care of yourself, right? And so sometimes anger isn't with another person, like we said, and then that is, ooh, huh, why am I triggered? Why, like I said, I think the social media might be a good example because no one did anything to you. Well, maybe they did, right? But you're not, 
you're not going to call them and have a conversation. But yeah, if our triggers, like what's, why am I getting so upset when the person barely cuts me off on the freeway? Hmm. Let me look into that. And that's going to give you guidance. And there's a right. reason why you got so ter- And I mean, I've had things too, where it's a minor something or a little thing. When I was a teacher, a kid would say something and I'd be really upset for a long time. And if you actually think about it, that could be helpful. Well, I think because I don't like this job and I'm really <laughs> doing something that's against my values and maybe I didn't have a boundary or maybe I'm all the things. So yeah, it's helpful. It's not always, it's, it can be simple, but not easy. And sometimes it's not simple at all. Yeah. It's interesting as we're talking about all this and anger, especially because often what I've learned more often than not, it's not about what somebody else did to us. It almost always comes back to something internal about that we're allowing or not doing ourselves. You know, it's it's about us Absolutely. not honoring our boundary. Mm-hmm. It's not really what somebody did. And what's really interesting about frustration as a guide, I cannot think right now what doctor or person in the mind body world talked about this, but I was recently listening to something about how frustration in the TMS mind body um, pain world, how often people actually don't associate with anger and yet they're all always low key frustrated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's because that's a way for us to avoid the actual real emotion because of the way anger has been portrayed in society. So it's almost like a, a shame attached to it. And like, we're talking about how there's healthy ways to express anger and And yet we can be so afraid to feel angry because of the judgment around it in our culture. And so I think that so many people avoid feeling angry by just being low-key frustrated all the time. And so that can be a really good guide to help us um, to notice like, man, if I'm always annoyed and irritated (laughs) and frustrated, what's really going on at a deeper level? Absolutely. Yes, I've definitely noticed Frust because especially if you think of yourself as a good girl or nice or oh I don't get angry. I remember someone saying I was explaining something and well I'm not angry. I don't get angry about it. They're like, that's the problem. You're probably repressing it. And yeah, frustrated, I definitely can relate to this myself and with clients. That's the word. And then going deeper, how do you really and then actually with a little bit of probing? and guidance, it's anger and it's rage. And then for men and a lot of us, not only men, but some men have been conditioned, right, of, right, have the stiff upper lip and, you know, real men don't cry and don't be sad and man up all this nonsense, right? And so a lot of men and a lot of us, this was me too, where we weren't comfortable with sadness. And so anger would go on top of that. So sometimes we can lash out, Again, Mm -hmm. why am I lashing out or in the car or getting really upset? Because it's safer and it's more accepted in our society. We see it on TV that anger is more acceptable, especially in different families and cultures, and being sad is not Mm -hmm. accepted. So anger is like a mask. Yeah, you can see it in both directions, either where it's being avoided depending on your thoughts or perception of it or whether it's being utilized instead of feeling sad or something deeper. Oh, it's so interesting. Exactly, because that's so normalized in our society. Oh, and we see men all the time. We see in the movies, he's mad, but then this like vulnerability with being sadness. So that's why, again, when we go back again, that th- there's always information or guides with our emotions, but it not might not be what we think when we look at it quickly, right? If we think, oh, I'm really sad. Like I one time was so angry about something. I did it some somatic. And then like in two seconds, I started crying. <laughs> like two yep. seconds. I had no idea it was there. I was shocked. But I was so excited kind of as a as a coach. Like, oh my gosh, this is so interesting because that's never happened before. So mm-hmm. underneath the anger, a lot of times is sadness, grief. And that is really challenging for a lot of us, especially if we've learned to, to repress it. If it's something that we judge and it's quite healing, it's quite powerful. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I love this conversation, but out of respect for time, I do want to give you a few minutes to also talk about your program because we talked a lot about how you do um, a lot of stress coaching, but you also do have a three-month program tailored to for mind-body clients who are experiencing pain or typical TMS um, illness symptoms. Could you speak a little bit about what that program's like? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So yeah, I work with people three months 
typically is what I do for a package. And people come to me through the mind-body community. And then I have clients who have no mind-body chronic pain. And like I said, someone's wanting a life change or a transition or some, you know, obviously anything stressful. If it's money, finances, career, I uh, can help with all of that because it's all related to stress. So yeah, so if in the mind-body community, People will work with me. We work on a weekly basis on Zoom together. We really get into this deep dive of the pain, bringing safety, understanding, like how to think about TMS. I mean, some people have been on a long TMS journey. They're very knowledgeable and they come to me and I'm more to like, let's get more into the body. Let's ground down these ideas and these beliefs. And then I work with people who are brand new, right? And these concepts are maybe this could be the first time that you're hearing about this. So I work with people who maybe are frustrated. Now we know they're really angry sometimes with their uh, progress. And we really do a deep dive. And what, what we notice is that there's something else to be done, right? I'm always working with my clients on maybe their family relationships or money or career or something else that really is lighting them up or a big change or transition. So that's really exciting. So yeah, getting the clarity to take your next steps, getting that, knowing what your values are, bringing down the pain, of course, that you can have this big life so we can not be the bystander in our life. Yeah. And I teach breath work every month online. So clients are able to join that and, and anyone can join that and be part of the community. And I also, what I think is really helpful, offer support throughout the week. So we're checking in through text. And if there's ups and downs, it's really nice to have a coach to guide you and be there for you. And I think that personalization, it can be really helpful. Like you said, if we're just in overwhelm or like, you know, typically if you talk to someone once a week, there could be in between times where you're feeling doubt or fear. And so it can be really helpful to be able to reach out to someone in between and get that support. Absolutely. Awesome. That's really great. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Awesome. You're welcome. Uh, what do you think? Any final thoughts or comments or just any insights that you wanted to share that maybe we haven't touched on yet that you felt were pertinent in this conversation? I just love this conversation. I want to remind people that emotions can be a call to action and it's scary and it's worth it. I just want to say it's worth it. You're worth it. And it's possible. And if you're doubting your healing potential, I wanted to let you know that that's possible And yeah, just more and more messages of hope and empowerment for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks for joining me for round two. Um, It was fun. I like this conversation and I appreciate you and everything that you're doing. And it's just nice to have you back here again. I love your upbeat energy. It's uh, contagious for sure. So that's that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jasmine. I loved being here. And these are such great questions. I hope it can help a lot of people. Absolutely. I think it will. All right. That's a wrap. Once again, I hope that you found today's episode insightful, inspiring, and helpful in some way. Please remember to click subscribe in your podcast platform of choice if you have not done so yet. And then you will always get each new episode waiting for you in your podcast library every week. Also, please like, review, and share this podcast to help me get the message of healing, hope, and possibility out to as many people as possible. As always, thanks for tuning in, and until next time, make this week great.